What I want to talk about is um, literary history. Um, literary history? Literary history. Um, and I will skip the, the first, um, just a few aspects here. Uh, literary history has been coming into trouble about 20 years ago. There were two challenges, basically. One being from a post-structuralist point of view, saying um, all history is constructed, um, especially under the aspect of power. And um, Lyotard's concept of the, um, the grand narrative was has become famous and kind of put an end to many kinds of history. Um, another form of criticism um, came from Hayden White who said basically history is a kind of fictional, history, historical works are a kind of fiction. Um, people are creating fictions by writing fictional uh, narratives about historical events. Um, there has been a long debate since then, but in a way, this the, these two attacks destroyed a lot of um, self-understanding things. People got irritated, um, and there have been two uh, resolutions or some resolutions for this. Um, in the practice of literary history, we have two experiments, one about, uh, both done by Americans actually, uh, one about uh, the French literature, another about German literature. Uh, the one about German literature is now, uh, has been published 2005. They try to get rid of all these grand narratives and they say we're just talking about little events. So you have a book with, I think, a few hundred um, little chapters and each chapter is is closely related to, a, in, to an event. This event can be the publication of the book, but very often it's an historical event. And then you have very small articles about a text, but there is nothing combining them to a history for, of whatever. And there is another approach to this um, saying, was there a problem? Um, sorry, I have, don't have to time for this kind of theoretical stuff. I have to write a history. Um, um, but very often, this kind of approach is a bit um, undercutting the, the theoretical discussions. So my approach was to say, maybe uh, we can tackle the theoretical problems, but without giving up. Um, so we had a lot of discussion here on constructivism and social constructions, and um, I think this is related to this point. Um, the criticism by Hayden White, I think that's the more interesting criticism actually, um, is in, in, if you look at it closer, you see that um, he says the, um, the source of patterns, patterns can be things like we have the rise or the fall or decline or whatever, any kind of pattern um, in historical representations um, has to be the historian because actually the historian has no direct access to the past. So if there is in, his histor in his, the historical representation um, a pattern and he points to the pattern, it must, he must be, the historian must be the source of it. And it implies in a way, and if you look closer at his writings, that the events and the information behind the events is in a way randomly distributed. So much randomly that any kind of pattern emerging from this has to be put upon this from the people who are describing what happened there. There's a two, there are twofold problems. First is, this is an ontology in itself. It says something about the reality, which is quite a strong assumption, actually. An assumption I, for example, don't share, um, that things are equally or randomly um, distributed. And another problem is he was talking about events, historical events. But actually, as literary historians, we are talking about texts. And texts are there. Um, it's nothing hidden in the past, uh, unapproachable for me. The text is very often here on my desk, and I can point to it, read it, and share it with others. So many of the criticism, a lot of the criticism directed at literary history for, by people like Welbury is, in my eyes, misdirected, but it's a challenge to show whether we can base our, our assumption whether there are patterns in the material on new, maybe more empirical-based sources. So, 
that's the, the, the frame I was talking about. And I'm going to talk about two specific problems. The first is something like influence, how to model influence. I'm taking a specific case of influence. We have a novel by Rousseau, uh, La Nouvelle Elise, and we have a novel by Goethe, Die Leiden des Jungen Werthers, and we have an expression describing this relationship. This source I'm trying, that you're reading now is um, a source, the, the, the book I'm quoting from, is, it's my bad translation, but, and um, I'm cutting a lot of things short, but basically it's one of the largest uh, history of German, his, uh, German literary history. So Rousseau's book was important for sensibility. That's the argument you find in the book. Um, then the description, then you have find a description of the reception of the novel and the content of the novel. And then, that's the important sentence, in this intellectual climate, Die Leiden des Jungen Werther originated. In this intellectual climate, they originated. Well, that's bad, isn't it? I mean, it's so obvious, so sloppy. And, um, and uh, I mean, model this, um, this is a real challenge. Um, that's what I first thought. But if you start to think about it, you say, that's interesting, actually. Um, they're talking about influence. But influence is a bad metaphor in itself, actually, because there is nothing pouring in or flowing into something. Um, the, the, the whole concept of influence is rather bad, actually, because the concept imposes the, the agent in influence is here Rousseau. But actually, Rousseau was rather um, in France at that time and not in Frankfurt writing the novel. So we have to switch things around and say, we're not talking about influence, but let's say selection. It's a proposal by a German um, sociologist. So Goethe selected this book as being important for him. Yeah, but selection, that's rather too intentional in the closer, in the, the narrow meaning of intentional meaning, um, because he had, no, he had no say in choosing this. So, Obviously, this is a very, and I'm not going down this, I just wanted to point to this, saying this is a very complex relation. And climate, if you look at this closely, is a very, very good expression of this relationship. It is like a metaphor and showing there is something there, a complex relationship, and we could unpack it, we being the historian of literary history, but he doesn't have the time or the place to do this. So he's just pointing to this. And replacing it by something which is more clear really loses all the information um, which is explicitly not said at that moment. So modeling has the challenge here to be explicitly vague. And I find this, uh, without, without, I find this a, a specific problem because it's much more easier to say, I do know what I'm, what I'm modeling, but saying, I know that there's a complex relationship and I can't model it at the moment, just point to the right direction. That's what language is doing all the time. And we don't have, or I can't see a way to model this at the moment. And replacing it with something more specific means that I quadruple or quantify the time of, I have to spend just with this relationship to um, an amount that it will, I will never finish a literary history at all. Um, so that would be my first question. What do you do about that? Um, second question, corpus studies. Um, empirical base, the, the, the wish to base your, inform, the, your um, assertions about literary history on something more empirical. Nowadays you go to corpus studies and you do something like this. This is an, uh, the result of an R macro. I'm very, very thankful for uh, Masei Ada and Jan Rybicki. Many of them you know, will probably seen has, have seen their presentation on the last um, DH. Um, they wrote a very nice macro which allows you to put in a group of texts and then um, say, please calculate using uh, some very easy uh, measurements, one of them based on John Barrow's Delta, um, 
use the distance of similarity between them, stylistic similarity based on the most frequent words. And the first thing you, you notice here, the, the colors at this, um, in this first few slides, the same color indicates the same author. So the first thing you notice is it's working rather perfectly. Um, it's a very, very simple measurement and it's working perfect, um, which is for a humanist who says everything is so complex, um, just counting words can't be, can't be doing it right, but it does. Um, even that you, you see the first, the one t uh, for, um, red text a little bit in distance to the others, um, that's the first novel by Fontane, and he wrote the rest 40, 40 years later, so it makes sense that there's a distance here. Um, then I started to throw um, books of a, diff a specific genre together with, unre with, with other books into this. Um, uh, you don't have to make any sense out of this image, but I want to switch to this. It's the same, but now you have in violet, you have um, groups which have erotic uh, the narratives as their content. And suddenly you see this tool is, at this moment, it, um, it finds genre. Not only author is the author is group, but the genre are group, or the texts belonging to one genre are grouped. Um, this is rather amazing. And you can do the same thing with gender. Um, here you have a lot of texts by different authors, and here you have them grouped um, by the same, it's the same diagram, just using different colors to express male and female authors, um, just based on most frequent words. Okay, that's what's out there, and many of you know this kind of tool. The problem now for me is how do these different things relate to each other? What is the data model here? The data model in a more narrow sense is obviously first, bag of words, and secondly, most frequent words. So the text is conceptualized as a bag of words, and then um, you have as an indicator of uh, stylistic similarity, you use most frequent words. And this is related to a conception of a concept like gender or the or erotic novel. And now, and this comes back to the discussion we had all the time here, what are we talking about here? What is gender a data model or what, because when we, as we very often in, um, we are tended to at this, in this discussion, when we tend to say every kind of conceptualization is a model, we have at least three models here, uh, somehow interrelated. Um, so maybe it's more fruitful, but that's just a proposal and I would like to discuss with uh, you, um, say, no, we are re referring to data model, to things like bag of words and most frequent words and maybe even just to bag of words and say most frequent words is, is not a data model at that moment because that's in the algorithm basically. And the other things are models, intellectual models. Um, and then we have a clear distinction and I have learned in the cooperation with Julia that's very German to have this preference for very clear distinctions. <laughs> Thank you. That were the, these are the two questions I wanted to pose to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You raise a couple of very interesting uh, things. One first thing is that uh, in the 21st century we have learned in the last 10 years there is no randomness in the distribution of anything or most of the things. So the normal distribution is absolutely not normal. And then you can, that's obviously also true for historic events because if people fight for a border, for example, rivers and mountains are not all over the place, so that will not happen in random places, for example. That is the one thing, so that's, that's the problem the, the more applied kind of research of, say, complex networks has with actor networks theory or other post structuralist uh, um, theoreticians, right? Because they, they, they just, they didn't consider the facts, which we know, right? And uh, you can measure historical data today, and you see the distributions are also not random. 
it's not rendered as discussed now in another movement, for example. And um, the other thing is this kind of uh, the question of the model emerging from the data, right? So there is a lot of modeling in the background of what, what is done there, right? Because most free converts does refer to something this is probably the most frequent words in the books um, as related to all the words in a corpus, which is uh, computer scientists call it TFI, right? term frequency verse document. There's a lot of model modeling you can do, right? Because you have some concept about the corpus. So without that, you cannot really stop. The other thing is with influence. There has been a huge discussion in art history, for example, about the direction of influence, right? There's this uh, excursions against influence by uh, Michael Black Sample of 1985, who points out there's way more verbs which describe the, the selection direction, right, and not the influence direction. But you're right, it could go both ways, right? But a lot of a lot of uh, data data disciplines have actually learned <coughs> that it makes much more sense to talk in the selection way, right? So if you think about cytometrics, people stop thinking about bibliometric coupling. But now they talk about co-citation, because what you have in terms of art history is called the T.S. Eliot effect. Once Rodin is around and does unfinished sculptures, our notion of influential changes forever. So co-citation or uh, selection makes the past a dynamic kind of culture. But if you look at influence, you say, OK, it's the static past, and it, mm -hmm. it only changes the future. And, and that's, that's somehow not really honest, right? Because every one of us has a different concept of the past. So the, the past is really better. And I think that's the things we have to take into account. And then if you do the bridge for this last thing of, the, of, of these consensus trees, that's very similar to another uh, domain where we have similarity and dependence, which is biology, where you have, they all, they, they just, they construct these trees and they point out in the textbooks, right? You cannot really find the root. You don't know where it, where's the origin of a shard, for example. It's probably not at the node where Fontana and somebody else goes. It could be somewhere else in this tree, right? So there is no top of hierarchy. Which Actually, is inconvenient. There is a point of zero in the, the These are, um, this is based on algorithms um, in, invented or developed by people in, the, in bioinformatics. And, mm -hmm. and there's one point in, to my. Um, layman's understanding where, where um, you can say everything is which is distance from starting from this point is has the same distance from each other. Mm -hmm. So um, but then as soon as you're in one of the branches um, things you can measure that distance to each other and say, okay I understand this is uh, this book is nearer to the other. But um, um, I'm not sure that I understand understood your comment about the model. What I wanted to, want to, to point out is that model would be the generic term, mm -hmm. which it also covers data modeling, obviously. Mm -hmm. but, um, and data modeling would be a very specific activity then. Um, so that we allow for things which are not really, which are vague, for example, as I point out, but they already, they have some, they use some kind of classification, some kind of um, understanding and putting into concept, but they express it differently and it's not, um, it doesn't have the, the same requirements as more data model. So with respect to the problem of how do we make progress on modeling when we know we can't get it exactly right, but it's now it's time to move on. Um, so uh, the, from an example, that is an example from my presentation, um, I, I said that it seemed that uh, according to our analysis, Berber um, entities should really be roles. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're doing that on sort of general principles, you're really, uh, it, it seems like, well, I mean, it seemed that like we were kind of anticipating or accommodating the possibility that, say, the text of what we did might have realized some other work. Say uh, special theory of relativity. Um, now that's nothing. How much time should one spend accommodating that um, you know, possibility? After all, it exists only in another possible, or maybe it's just the future of a possible world, but no library institution. So it did seem to us that um, 
there was a class of, um, of modeling improvements that were probably not worth pursuing in actual situations, just like denormalized relational databases are often much more effective for querying or speed or something mm -hmm. like that. So we conceded that denormalized ontologies, um, which would be ones that weren't quite right, uh, could often be better and ought to be preferred to ones that were exact. Mm -hmm. So one way to pursue it is by saying we're not going to pursue this puzzle. We're not going to figure out exactly how to do it right. We have we have something that works. We're confident if it will work going forward. Now that particular case is one where you're not saying anything false. There are other cases where it seems like don't solve the problem, we might be saying something false. Ship of Theseus, you just reconcile yourself to the fact that, um, in principle, you know, there is a removal of a part that makes a different ship, and a small part that doesn't. And, 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 it's, and also assume that you won't be iterating transitivity of identity a thousand times in your, on your ships, vis-a-vis your, -vis your ships or your, or your texts. Yeah. And cross your fingers and move on. It's, it's not the shuttle. Or, you know. okay. Maybe I understood this I misunderstood it, but would it mean that you have to at least you have one position how this relationship is modeled, um, for example, between the two books and say, um, I can say, I can say at least this about them. And then finding that people in the humanities tend to use very often metaphors or other uh, vague descriptions, which are deliberately vague, because they, they, that's the most effective way, actually, of conveying so much but not more information. I would distinguish metaphor, the issue of metaphorical <coughs> and idiomatic usage from, from vagueness. So I think vagueness is a, a very uh, precisely identify issue, very, it's very important to have bank terms in ordinary communication. And it's hard to accommodate them in modeling. Um, but a vagueness is probably, uh, allowing yourself vagueness um, will probably not have the same kinds of um, uh, input, give you the same influence of this results, in fact, it gives you most of the good results, um, as, uh, as trying to uh, represent metaphorical usage um, in, in no, data description languages um, that represent a metaphor as if it were literal. There, I think you'll have objects that don't exist in your ontology. Yeah, if you take them literally, <coughs> right. totally agree. You have to translate the, what the expression refers to, you have to uh, translate right. it in a way, but then the, the, the question is, how precise can this translation be and without losing the intention of to be vague? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the question is. Um, exactly, precisely. <laughs> <laughs> I think the descriptive, you say um, you would like to, to keep this apart, wake metaphor. And um, my point would be to say metaphors are, in this, for example, in this case I analyzed, um, is a way to refer to something by keeping it wake. The relationship it denotates is deliberately wake. And so you just put it away. Actually, exactly that, what I would, would like to include into my description of what these kind of sentences do in the humanities. And if you wanted to point out that they are much better in a way than we usually think of them, um, because um, they obviously um, they are not working as, um, as clear cut uh, references as we uh, think they should. Yeah. I, I guess I'll just say that. You know, vagueness is um, something which you know, no one has ever managed to free from paradox and puzzle. It's essential to communication. 
<laughs> right, but I, I think everything Fotos says actually speaks to that. I think yeah. that they're, they're, we're actually looking at something really tremendously important here because what, what, um, what I think this relates to is actually our conversations about uh, about pre-formal versus formal descriptions of our objects, or you know, the improvisational stages, the raw stages, versus the more refined, more formalized, and the more specified stages later on, and how you don't ever, in a sense, want to end the previous stage even while you move into the next stage, because you've got that that you know the paradoxes and the the, the the relationship between those stages. Because when 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 you as a scholar step back and you say, I'm going to describe this as a climate, right? I mean the beauty of a metaphor is it says one thing very, very specifically, very precisely, and then implies many other things, and it leaves another set of things completely unstated and in the air, right? So it's not that the, that the metaphor is vague, it's that a metaphor is a way of saying something <coughs> and not even addressing other things, right? And by, by virtue of applying a different, you know, a different language, a different perspective on the problem, right? And so this, this isn't to say that we're saying something vague, it's to say that we're saying something, but we're deliberately foregoing the opportunity to spend 10 years in the question of exactly what we mean by X, Y, Z, right? Actually, I think and, yeah, it means this depends on what you mean when you say something. You don't say something vague. Um, the expression climate isn't vague. But the, that's right. Uh, the, all the possible exactly. things you can do based on this uh, expression, right. they, that's a very, and it, it's not something that's what's important with them. Maybe implying that this one could be in this one. That's right. And and it because that's sense. unspecified, it's left between the author and the reader to sort of agree implicitly on the uh, appropriateness of the metaphor without any explicit or, or spelled out understanding of it, what, what those implications are can be taken to mean, right? And so in a sense what it, 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 it's it's really a res it's a it's a determination of the resolution of the image that you're going to apply. It's like I'm gonna go all the way down here and pix you know, pixelate this, you know, intricately, and yet this other thing, I'm going to step back and say, I can see the shape of this without ever trying to get down into the details and leave it to my reader to come along with me on this, right? So, you know, it, it it relates both to this question about what we choose not to formalize or what we decide we can't formalize, and to this question of how we relate to our audience and the nature of the performance, right? In other words, that there's a, a process that a scholar undergoes which involves selection not only of, 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 of what to study, but how to approach it, and where to emphasize, and where to, you know, clarify. Yeah. Did you say that against the Lego metaphor? <laughs> I would leave you to do the Lego metaphor. <laughs> I think in terms like gender and influence and authorship and are not, and this is maybe to, just to restate what Wendell said, they're, they're not vaguely defined or ill-defined. They're, they're deliberately undefined. They're, they're deliberately put forth with, with, with ever-tentative definitions. And the reason for that is because that is the contested site of the discourse. And if you're going to solve for X where X is gender, you are, as far as I'm concerned, concerned with the project of trying to destroy literary studies as a topic. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not being, I'm not joking. I mean, these, these things are not, I mean, what's mystifying us? The only thing I see in terms of a data model in, in this is, is a bunch of key value pairs that tie words to frequencies. That's the only data model that's here. Everything else is a function or a process or some, you know, something else. And at the end of that thing is something, you know, these words like gender and influence, and, and this is absolutely mystifying to me. I mean, I don't know how we start with word counts and end with, and end with gender, but it may be that we're, we're hoping that, that somehow, we feel like there should be some relationship, like given what we started with, there should be some clarity at the end of the process, but I wonder if that's what, it doesn't seem to be that we're looking for clarity on questions of things like gender and influence. In, in other words, when you say, Influence is a bad metaphor. It seems to me that you have made an absolutely trenchant and marvelous literary critical observation. And you don't want to destroy that <laughs> with your algorithms. Or you don't want to, or if your algorithm sheds sight on, light on that, uh, more power to you. But that doesn't mean that we're going to sort of end up with defined terms for things like gender and 
You addressed this to him or to me? Uh, to you, I guess. Uh, yeah, but uh, just to just to the just to the, the spirit of the conversation. I get frustrated in text analytical discussions because people say that can't possibly define gender. And, and all I can think is none of you can define gender. None of you. I mean, you've already been the problem because that's what we, that, is what, that is what our discourse is about. I'm a bit less pessimistic about definitions uh, or explications, which is much more useful in this context, but um, it doesn't matter here because I wouldn't say this. We are talking about that the, the numbers and the relationship to each other is a definition or explication of gender, but obviously the concept of gender is in close relation to what the numbers show us. And that's the main point here. So that we have a model of the world talking, uh, dividing population in two or more groups and, and numbers which, for some reasons we don't understand yet, do the same um, with, with text. And I think that's interesting. Um, yeah, no, no, me too. The, the subject to which I've told in my life. Yeah. But, 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 but it's the anxiety that bothers me. I'm not accusing you of that. I'm just saying no, no, no. that yeah, I think I'm accusing you. Critics of text analysis. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm with you, totally. <laughs> 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 well, actually, two remarks. First is general. Um, if we talk about labels and ambiguity, I think natural language is, is best suited for those. Why is there anything else but natural language um, for expressing them? Um, as to gender and genre, um, they would be first class citizens in any RDFS um, based like by ontology. So um, they may not be part of the data model, um, but they would be perfect part of a compositional model like RDF, um, which is somewhere between a data model in the strict sense and, and language. I had a nice conversation yesterday with Alan about how RDF would relate to natural language. Um, I think this is the moment where we can take this up again. A response or? No, no, I think it was more of a moment. Okay. I would, I, would, I would disagree on the fact that <coughs> of the key value pairs we're talking about, I think there is a beta model. In the beta model, there's two keys. One is the text and the other one is the words. And then there is, for every one of these two keys, there is a key value pair. You have the frequency of words in the book, and you have the frequency of books for a word, which is a network. And basically, all the models we are talking about um, are consistent of this kind of basic construction of bipartite networks. If you're lucky, there is only one thing, which is a self -book. And this thing is the thing you do measurements on, which is very, very interesting. So the TF-IDF model, if you count words and compare it to the average um, um, frequency of the word in the total codes, that's what, what's equivalent to the climate, right? That that's the mean field model, that there is some, 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 some universal distribution of the word is and that and I and A and stuff like that, right? So the point is, this kind of, this kind of uh, uh, analysis has actually a more complete notion of data model than most of our models have. I, don't, I just don't, I feel like the three that TF idea has Yeah, no, no, it doesn't, it's not, it's not a math data model, but conceptually it presupposes that you have this pair of things. Yeah. Yeah, and, and then you have this, there's this true relation between word and text. And then in the background, and that's the thing you usually don't do, there is this mean field, right? Which, which they say, okay, it's the frequency of the corpus because I don't have all the books in the row, right? And I think if you, if, you, if you consider that, it's a very interesting thing to talk about the vagueness of climate because in fact here, the climate is based on one instance, which is Rousseau. And Rousseau, the atoms of Rousseau-ness are not distributed in a mean or average way. So that means that basically this post-structuralist notion of climate as something based on a few instances is actually not accurate. Yeah, okay? I, 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 